thank you for this evening. Thank you for these brethren who continue to show a hunger and thirst for the things of thy word and of thine. Thank you that you did not leave us in the dark, groping through trial and error as to what might take place in the future. You've given us your more sure word of prophecy that, as Peter said, it will do us well that we take heed because it's like a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in our hearts. Whenever Father give us hearts that are teachable, help us to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. Open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law and uh, pray for you to work in our hearts, minister to our needs, to bring instruction, encouragement, perhaps conviction or rebuke so that uh, those who will hear this will either come to know Christ as personal Savior in the light of your imminent return or believers, those of you who already belong to your family through the miracle of the new birth may, may all the more <clears throat> with the hope of the blessed coming, uh, live pure lives, knowing that anyone that hath this hope in us purifieth himself, even as the art pure. And uh, uh, we thank you for what you're going to do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So let, let me get to... Uh, have you made me a host already? Brother Jacob. Okay, screen. <clears throat> so for the last two uh, weeks, we looked at some prophetic portions of scripture that uh, is particularly in the New Testament. And uh, we looked at Second Timothy chapter 3, all the way to chapter 4. Somehow, these are Paul's inspired writings that talks about what's going to happen towards uh, the time just prior to the rapture. So sin will increase, lawlessness will abound. Evil men shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And in contrast, Paul tells Timothy to continue in the word. <clears throat> so uh, now, of course, we, we moved on to the next lesson, which is the coming of the man of sin. So from, from prior to the rapture, pre-rapture, pre so this escalation of sin will continue to snowball until it reaches its zenith to the coming of the man of sin, Satan incarnate. So that's how thing, the trend is going to be. So we put out. That uh, one of the marks soon return of our Lord Jesus Christ, both in terms of the rapture and preparation for the at the end of the seven year tribulation is deception. There's going to be so much deception taking place. Truth will not matter to many people. In fact, in Second Thessalonians 2, the passage we looked at still in the New Testament that people will choose rather to believe a lie. And because people will choose to believe a lie despite the glaring evidence of truth, is uh, God will simply give them what they've been asking for so that God himself will give them, uh, send them strong delusion so that they will believe the lie. Okay, so, uh, and that's a scary thought. See, when, when people, nobody can be neutral towards Jesus Christ. When people, eventually reject the truth, they, they do not stay neutral. They end up uh, believing myths, fables, error, lies. And the doctor, author of lies, 1 Timothy 4, is uh, the devil himself. So we continue with our next uh, lesson. This time we're going to look at the Old Testament. Okay, And we're talking about uh, an alliance of nations that will start taking place. And it is already taking place now. But it will, f again, uh, come into full fruition during the tribulation period. So, again, thank you for this privilege. And uh, we'd like to welcome everybody. Good evening to all of you. And uh, thank you for joining in. All right. So what is next? So it's, it'll do as well to know what's happening because 
These are the things that are already unfolding before our very eyes. And therefore, they should put us on our toes. John said in 1 John 3, verse 2, Any man that hath this hope, the hope of his soon coming, any man that hath his hope in, in him, purifies himself even as he, Christ, or God, is pure. He's one of divine attributes. John also in chapter 2, verse 28 of the first epistle, tells us that we should abide in him so that when he comes, uh, we should not be ashamed at his coming. So let's talk about the alliance of nations. As, apart from deception that will increase to the point that Satan will use signs and lying wonders in order to win more people or deceive people into his lies, there is going to be an alliance of nations. And uh, the book of Ezekiel talks about this. If you, want to be, if you want to be keen about things that will take place, I remember Jesus said, we will not know his exact time of his coming, but we will know when it is near. So he cites the example of you see clouds forming. You don't know exactly the falling of the rain, but you know when the clouds are forming, you know that the rain is about to fall. So when you see deception taking place and in an increasing uh, crescendo, at the same time, the alliance of nations taking place then. Therefore, these are indications of his any moment return. In the book of Ezekiel, since this is the book we're looking at, I want to give you a background of that. So this is Ezekiel's background. There were three Babylonian captivities. Remember, Israel was a theocracy. God himself was their king who led them from Egypt through the wilderness wanderings into the land flowing with milk and honey. The land flowing in the honey, that's Israel, was the place of obedience and the place of blessing. But in the, in the, uh, in the law, the Pentateuch, uh, God made it clear that if you obey me, I will bless you. And he will continue to help them enjoy the abundance of the land flowing in the honey. But if you disobey me, you see the list of blessings and curses in the last few chapters of Deuteronomy and Leviticus. If you disobey me, I will curse you. And if you persist in your disobedience, God says, I will scatter you abroad. And that's exactly what happened. So uh, Daniel eventually later on gave us a revelation of who are these Gentile nations that will eventually become world powers. Of course, it used to be that Israel was a world power. And then eventually... Uh, uh, the northern kingdom of Judah and southern kingdom there was a split after King Solomon. And uh, eventually King, the Assyrians took over the northern kingdom, while after which the Babylonians took over Assyria and therefore took over Israel, the northern kingdom. And as Babylon took over the northern kingdom, eventually they also took over uh, the uh, southern kingdom of Judah. Okay. So uh, Ezekiel Habakkuk was one of the contemporaries of Jeremiah who saw Judah eventually about to be taken place by Babylon, okay, by the Chaldeans, referring to the same people, the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. Now, Ezekiel was one of them. Daniel was one of them carried on to captivity. He was brought to Babylon. Daniel was one of them, you will recall. And uh, Ezekiel was also one of the prophets brought there. There were three Babylonian captivities. That's in the days of Daniel, 605 to 606 BC. And then 596 to 597 AD. That's in Ezekiel's day. And then 586 to 587 BC during Zedekiah's day. Okay? Ezekiel writes his prophecies while on, in Babylonian captivity. An outline of his book. You see in the first 25 chapters, the fate of Judah, that's the southern kingdom, and the theme is that of desolation, how God had to judge not only the northern kingdom, but this time the southern kingdom because of their uh, disobedience. God was using a heathen people, the Babylonians. You will see that in Habakkuk. Habakkuk was wrestling with God. How can you, God, use an unholy people to chastise us, your covenant people. And that was God's doing. God was dealing with his disobedient children, but at the same time, he was raising up the wicked Babylonians. So the fate of Judah was also described by Ezekiel. The theme is desolation, the first 25 chapters. And then um, 
The foes of Judah are mentioned in chapters 26 to 32. The theme of those chapters has to do with uh, destruction. And then the future of Judah and Israel. It talks about the theme of which is restoration. So God's dealings with his people, his covenant people Israel, was to judge them. Remember, before God judged them with Gentile powers, God sent them prophets. And they did not listen to the prophets. These prophets were Jewish people whom at least they can understand their language. But because they were not listening, God sent them the heathen nations. They did not understand their language, but this time they will understand that this was God's judgment to get them to listen. So, and these succeeding Gentile powers, you see this in the book of Daniel, part of Daniel's vision is the Babylonian Empire, which was characterized which was turned over by the Medo-Persian Empire and then turned over by the Grecian Empire in the days of Alexander the Great, and then later on the Roman Empire, which eventually reached the time of Jesus Christ. Israel was under the Roman Empire until the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, which, and then the Roman Empire was, not, was never conquered by another empire. It kind of just hibernated because of so much carnality. So it kind of just weakened. So that sometime in 470 AD, the Babylonian had weakened, or, Babylon, or rather the Roman Empire had already weakened. But Daniel talks about a revived Roman Empire that will eventually take place because it was never conquered by another, Babel, another heathen uh, empire. There is going to be a revival of this Roman Empire, which will be led by the man of sin or the Antichrist. But we're looking at uh, another scene now, another alliance of nations. The Antichrist will have his own uh, power and influence over the whole world. But there will be another group of alliance of nations he mentioned here by Ezekiel. God was dealing with his nation, covenant people, as in keeping with his covenant, there was going to be God gave a covenant, not only the Mosaic covenant, which is the Pentateuch, and then the Deuteronomy Covenant, that is the land, specifically there is the Davidic Covenant in 2 Samuel 7 and the New Covenant when God has promised himself, bound himself to change Israel's stony hearts with a new heart that will be placed there by the Holy Spirit. That's what is called as the New Covenant mentioned in Ezekiel 36 and Jeremiah 31. So in keeping with the New Covenant, Judah and Israel will be restored. There's going to be a national restoration, a geographical restoration. People will go back to Israel in spite of their being led captive in different parts of the world. They're scattered by the diaspora. They will be brought to Israel geographically and nationally, and that was fulfilled officially in 1948 when they became a nation recognized by the under the and of course recognized by the United States after World War II. And then there's going to be not only a national geographical restoration, there's going to be a spiritual restoration, and God will replace replace the stony hearts of Israel with a heart that is in line with his will, uh, placed by the Spirit of God. That's the spiritual restoration. The, the national restoration has happened, they have become a nation once again. There is now a pilgrimage of Jews from different parts of the world to geographically relocate in Israel. That's already currently happening. The spiritual restoration has not happened. Israel as a nation is still rejecting the Messiah. There are individual Jews who have trusted Christ as Savior, but as a nation, they still have rejected Jesus Christ. Just as it was in the days of, of the first century. Now, why did God give such favor to Israel? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why is God so gracious to Israel? Why did God become flesh of the person of Jesus Christ who was a Jew? Why didn't he become Filipino or Singaporean or American, or whatever the case might be? Well, the answer to that is found in the verses I cited here. It is not because they were better in, than any other nation, but it was all because of God's grace not uh, to be so that they would be a repository for his word okay most of the writers of scripture were jewish with the exception of luke but they were the ones who were custodians of the word of god old and new testament 
that they might also be the human ancestry through which the Messiah would be born. So Deuteronomy 7, 6 to 8 are the verses where God says why God chose them. It was not because they were more or better. It's because they just he just loved them. It was grace. Romans 9 talks about Paul's burden for the nation of Israel, whom he recognized, to whom were given the covenants and the promises and the, and the tabernacle and concerning Christ became flesh. The nation of Israel were was the privileged nation through which God would reveal himself to the rest of the Gentile world and the whole world for that matter. Okay, so uh, what a privileged nation they were, but they had taken their privileges for granted, sadly, so that now God had to deal with them and chastise them. Now, we're talking about the alliance of nations between Russia and Islamic nations here, and Ezekiel mentions that in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Russia is believed to have a role to play in biblical prophecy where God strikes this nation and judges her. Why? Because Russia has challenged God by her ways of life, standard of morality, particularly by her ideology, which is communism. We know that communism is a godless ideology. It hates God, doesn't want to recognize God. Uh, religion is the opium of the people, as the, its founders say. So and Russia did not realize that while they would be giving, they would be challenging God, they did not realize that God would ultimately accept her challenge. <clears throat> communism, why is this communism so dangerous? Because number one, uh, it's not only a religion, it's an ideology that dethrones God. Listen to what, uh, um, uh, what some of the writers have said. Brethren, I come to announce unto you a new gospel, he says, uh, Louis uh, Bowman quotes, and says, which must penetrate to the very ends of the world. The world uh, must be destroyed and, re and replaced by a new one. The lie must be stamped out and give way to the truth. The first lie is God. The second lie is right. And when you have freed your minds from the fear of God and from the childish respect of, for the fiction of right, then all the remaining chains that bind you and which are called science, civilization, property, marriage, morality, and justice will snap under or asunder like threads. As Michael Bakunin says in, uh, the, in the 19th century, 1814 to 1876, okay? He was a Russian anarchist and said in his book, God and the State. So uh, furthermore, <clears throat> oops, hold on. My screen is again, uh, okay. Furthermore, notice what Karl Marx says. In the Communist Manifesto, he insisted that economic forces play the largest part in determining the course of history. And he thought that the only real thing in the world are material things. And that for communists, a spirit world does not exist. So this is the what is called dialectical materialism or communism. The idea is sometimes called economic determinism or economic determinism of history. Now remember, Jesus said, already warned in <clears throat> Luke 12, 15, beware of covetousness, <clears throat> for a man's life consisteth not in the things which he possesses. And yet despite that warning that Jesus gave, of course, people would, like, would rather ignore the warnings of our, the Son of God and rather believe what they you know, the figments of their imagination or the lies that they hear. Okay, now aside from communism uh, dethrones God, communism deifies man. Karl Marx said the criticism of religion ends the doctrine that man is the supreme being for man. Okay. A total disregard for God himself. So you would think that the Antichrist will have that kind of a mindset. But the Antichrist believes in God, but he, the God that he believes will be himself, okay? Communism, on the other hand, is an ideology that denies God and the, and the spiritual. Everything there is is matter. So they're, they're naturalists. They deny the things of the other world or the supernatural. 
listen to this hymn sung by Russian communist children. That's part of their brainwashing way back in 1949. The whole world, this is a hymn that we're familiar with. The whole world at last is beginning to see the blight of the world is Jesus. Keep out the blight or blight or blighted you'll be. The blighted for life for credulity. Once I believed, but now I can see the blight of the world is Jesus. Wow. Uh, height of blasphemy. But scripture speaks of a day when this godless nation will seek to thwart God's purposes and plans for the nation of Israel. And that's what we see in our passage this, uh, this evening, Ezekiel 38 and 39. So, <clears throat> so let's see what who Gog and the land of Magog uh, are. So, um, okay. In Ezekiel 38, if you have your Bibles open, of course, I have some of the passage here with the passages here with us. But nonetheless, I'd like for us to follow through the passages because there are passages I did not, I was not able to, to cite in the screen. So Ezekiel 38, it says it uh, talks about the land of Gog, uh, of Gog, the land of Magog. Okay, let me turn to that myself. Ezekiel chapter 38. Okay, so it says in verse 1, so God was prophesying through his prophet Ezekiel, uh, and some 2,000, what, five, 600 years since from today. So this has been long prophesied of over two uh, millennia. And it says, and the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Now, Gog, obviously a leader of a coalition of na nations, it says, set, set thyself, thy, thy face against Gog, which is the land of Magog. Okay. Is the, the place. He's a leader. Uh, and he's the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. Now, that word chief is the Hebrew word Rosh. So the King James translates that the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. So uh, the Hebrew word Rosh could be interpreted as an adjective. And if it's interpreted as an adjective, then chief is the, right, is, uh, the more appropriate word to use in the English. So the chief prince, meaning high exalted, if the Hebrew word is interpreted as an adjective. But if the Hebrew word is translated or interpreted as a proper noun, as the other translators worded this, he is translated the prince of Rosh. Okay, if the Hebrew word is interpreted as a proper noun. Okay. So Rosh, however, as we will note, corresponds with Russia. Meshek corresponds with Moscow. Tubal is with Tobolsk, the chief city of what is now Siberia. Now, how do we know that? Then uh, we will see some correlation. It says the Gog and then the land of Magog. Now, as we compare part, uh, scripture with scripture, okay. Okay, my screen is hanging again, so. <clears throat> Okay, the land of Magog or the Magogites were called Scythians by the Greeks who lived in the Caucasus Mountains up north. And Magog, if you go back to Genesis chapter 10, you will recall this is after the flood. Genesis 6, 7, and 8 uh, and 9 is the flood of Noah's day. And then by the end of chapter 9 and the beginning of chapter 10, you have a genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So from where they eventually settled, and there are people who said that they have seen the ark actually uh, somewhere in the boundary of uh, Russia. And... Uh, <clears throat> and uh, that's where it migrated, it, it settled. And Genesis chapter 10, verse 2 says, The sons of Japheth, Japheth, 
Shem, Ham, and Japheth were the sons of Noah. And who were the sons of Japheth? These are Gomer, and Magog, and Madai, and Javan, and Tubal, and Meshech, and Tyras. And then verse 3, the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, and Rivat, and Togarma. These are names mentioned in this list that Ezekiel mentions. Well, these are the sons of Japheth, and then the sons of Shem and Ham, eventually Shem's uh, descendants migrated down towards the uh, Middle East. The sons of uh, uh, the Japheth migrated towards, stayed somewhere in the south, in the north. And then the, son, uh, sh of the sons of Ham migrated towards the far east. More likely we are the descendants of Ham. But here it's ta it talks about uh, God. Magogites and Magog was one of the sons of Japheth, and because of the, the land area where he uh, it was the land and became the land where he actually settled. Some of our allies are mentioned in this chapter, Ezekiel 38, and they are Persia, which we know as present day Iran, which will also cover Afghanistan and Pakistan and Kazakhstan, Ethiopia. Or Kush corresponds with Somalia and parts of Sudan. Some say this Iraq will be part of that. Uh, Libya or Put is one of the sons of Ham and also a descendant of a Persian tribe. Gomer uh, to correspond to Germany, but more includes also the Baltic states, the Central European states further north and Germany as a whole. Togarma is known to be Turkey, or is old, old Armenia. And uh, as you will look at these nations, many of which are coming from the north. And um, one common thread that they have is mostly they are uh, Islamic nations who will be allied with Russia. And Ezekiel 38, going back to that chapter, Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 2 uh, tells us, or rather verse 6, that Gomer, all his bands, the house of Togarma, the north quarters, and all his band, and many people with thee. So in other words, it talks about a coalition that will be led from the north or of the north quarters, it mentions. And it, that, that phrase of, appears often in this chapter, okay? Now, there's going to be a coalition of nations. One common thread, will, most of them will be, are actually Islamic. And we know currently, ever since the 9-11, uh, of course, Islam, uh, terrorism has come to the fore, as we mentioned earlier. And uh, as I also mentioned earlier, during the there was a bombing in the Boston Marathon, and uh, they found out there were two terrorists who eventually are, are Muslims, and they came from Russia. So when I heard that news, I said, well, Russia and the, some of the Islamic uh, terrorists are now ally, aligning. Well, that exactly reminded me of this prophecy of Ezekiel. Now, but this alliance of nations, while they seem to be forming now, they yet uh, have, they have not yet, uh, the scripture is not yet being fulfilled because although this is simply a setting of the stage of the coming alliance that will take place, as to when this invasion of this alliance will take place, they will all align against the nation of Israel. These verses say when the timing of this invasion will be. In verse 8 of chapter 38, after many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years. Thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people. So there's the restoration and against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, that it is brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely, all of them. So in other words, it will happen at a time when Israel is dwelling safely. Again in verse uh, four, in 14, Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, thou shalt not know it. 
thou shalt not, shalt thou not know it? 16, and thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. So this is going to be a mighty army. They will cover the land. It shall be in the latter days. So we're given those hints there. And I will bring thee against my land that, that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. So these verses give us an indication of the timing of this invasion. It'll be in the latter years, verse 8. It is to be in that day when my people Israel dwelleth safely in the latter days. Now this indicates what? So when is Israel going to dwell in safety? To this day, we know that there are a lot, all of, the, all of Israel's neighbors, much of it is Islamic, and they are all against Israel. The only... And while Israel, as some of you know, those of you who work in the military, Brother Jacob knows this. I remember having a short uh, discussion with him sometime uh, in the car, in his car, is that, uh, of course, Israel is well equipped with uh, high-powered uh, weapons, high calibered and uh, top of the line. And, of course, the only ally that Israel has ever since um, World War II, during, after the uh, Holocaust, is America. This is not surprise. It is therefore not surprising why terrorists will try to attack America, and what is their interest of America aside from its wealth? It's because they are all against Israel. They're trying to cripple Israel against uh, by somehow disheartening or discouraging its main ally, and therefore, since they are now under so much tension with their neighbors, so that. Uh, <clears throat> You know, there had been three treaties that have been uh, signed uh, with Jordan, with Palestine, and with Egypt. Why? Because there's so much tension. And yet, while those treaties actually already exist, they are not being enforced to this very day because of increasing tension amongst those nations in that part of the world. So, but when will Israel dwell in safety? So this indicates that this will happen when? During the first half of the tribulation period. The tribulation period is known and stated by Daniel as the 70th week of Daniel. Where in that prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, I cannot turn there because of limited time, is uh, uh, the prince that shall come, talking about the Antichrist, will enter into or rather will confirm the covenant with Israel. Okay. at the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel. But as Matthew 24, 15 tells us, Jesus talks about the Olivet Discourse when the uh, abomination of desolation will happen. That will happen sometime in the middle of the tribulation period when the Antichrist will reveal his true colors. He will start entering into a peace treaty as a peace-loving diplomat with Israel. And therefore, Israel will somehow enjoy some degree of safety with the Antichrist. Unfortunately for Israel, the Antichrist will reveal his true colors and will claim to be God. That's when Israel will finally say, this is not the God that we were looking forward to, not, not the Messiah that we, we knew, uh, uh, we, that we knew from the Old Testament. So more likely this, this invasion will take place sometime in the first half, or perhaps towards the end of the first half of that uh, first three and a half years of the tribulation period. Okay. It's the day of God's wrath, Revelation 6, 17 says. And the great tribulation, as Jesus called it, is going to the second half of uh, the seven-year tribulation period. That's the timing of that invasion. Now, what will be the itinerary of the enemy? It's, it's detailed already for us in Ezekiel 38, verses 8 through 16. Israel is, of course, as we already know from the Old Testament, God said he was giving them the promised land. It was a land flowing with milk and honey. It is the very reason why other nations continue to show interest on her. There's a lot of resources in Israel. She has inestimable wealth in the Dead Sea. It has vast amount of oil reserves. She has access to water bodies such as the Jordan River, the Mediterranean Sea. 
And these all make these details or these uh, factors make Israel a coveted spot in the world. There is not a nation that does not know of her wealth, and certainly no nation would refuse uh, an opportunity to share in it. However, while everybody else, including the, uh, the, uh, the sur surrounding neighbors, would like to lay claim over that small strip of land called Israel, and the Arabs, as well as the, the uh, Muslim Islamic world, claimed that to be theirs, they were the former Canaanites, Hittites, Jebusites. They were driven away. They said, we, that's our land. You just took it from us. However, the title deed of that property is already in, is given to us, recorded in the inspired word of God. And it's recorded in Genesis 15, verse 18. <clears throat> so it's spelled out by God himself to Abraham. So just to give us an idea of Israel. So notice this, this land. Okay. This uh if this, as you see, this world map, okay, so that's why it's called the Middle East. It's right in the middle. So you see Israel right there in the middle of this world map. Of course, you are. We see towards the east is uh, that's where our nations are, the Far East, and then the Pacific Ocean. Towards the west, you see, of course, the Atlantic Ocean and uh, the United States and Europe and so on and so forth. As you look at the map, Israel is right there in that small box. Okay. Now, notice where, how strategic is Israel's location. Okay. Number one, Israel's right in the middle. Any history book will tell us that the, the uh, beginning of civilization began in this area of the world. Okay. The Fertile Crescent, as world history books will tell us. And notice in the uh, western part of Israel is the Mediterranean Sea. So there is a body of water there. The eastern part of Israel, you, that's where you see uh, Iraq, and then uh, Iran, and then Palestine, and then, of course, India, and so on and so forth. So that's desert land. And, of course, for people to live, they need water. So it's not, it's not easy to live in an arid desert area. That is why people would like Israel, that strip of property, it's because it's close to the Mediterranean Sea. Aside from that, notice Israel is a strip, small strip of land that connects three continents. continents okay? So in the um, north is Russia and eventually the Western world. So you have uh, <clears throat> uh, Europe eventually as one continent. And if, of course, if Europe can, can control Israel, it will have access for them if they want to go to the other parts of the world in Africa, which is another continent down south of Israel. And of course, in the eastern part is Asia. Okay. <clears throat> so you have Asia, Africa, and Europe as three continents that where Israel could be a bridge from one to the other. No wonder a lot of people covet this strip of land. And that is why God chose it. That's the reason why God uh, started the church in the nation of Israel. And that is why humanity began there. Why? Because to propagate the earth and to propagate the gospel, it will be strategic to have it started in the Middle East so that the gospel can spread easily rather than in the corner of the West or the corner of the East. It'll start right there in the middle. It's a very strategic place for any part of the world to be interested in, aside from its resources and such like. So that explains to why a lot of people are after that strip of land, aside from the fact, of course, God himself is the one who gave it to them. Okay, so let's look at another map here. Uh, here we have uh, Israel. According to Genesis 15, verse 18, okay? So according to Genesis 15, verse 18, uh, this is actually the, the uh, territory that God had promised them. In the same day, verse 18 of Genesis 15, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. This is the Abrahamic covenant saying, unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt. That's the Nile River. 
unto the great river, the river Euphrates. So that's their whole strip of land. So this left, or rather the uh, left side of the map is where you see the Mediterranean Sea. And God has promised them the entire strip of land all the way to the Euphrates River. Okay, so that's going to be the land that they will be occupying, especially during the millennium. But they can't do that right now, apparently, because they have a lot of tension and enemies around among their neighbors. Okay, so let's continue with our study. So let's move on. Now, while this invasion will take place by a huge army of a coalition of nations, uh, and uh, it will sound like Israel will be so helpless because Israel will be alone. What is interesting in this Ezekiel passage is that uh, where is America, who is the strongest ally of the mentioned by Ezekiel? We already know it's going to take place sometime in the first half, towards the end of the first half of the tribulation period. Where is America? Well, apparently he is not mentioned there. And uh, <clears throat> how powerful as America may be today, perhaps during that time, uh, America will lose its power or strength or influence. Some writers have speculated that perhaps there are many Christians in America so that when the rapture takes place, a lot of believers will no longer be there. And many of loyal citizens who pay their taxes will no longer be around. And that will contribute to the weakening of America. I tell you, the rapture is going to be a real big game changer. A lot of things will take place that will change the landscape, just like it changed the landscape when COVID-19 came into the scene, much more so when the rapture takes place. So apparently, whatever the reasons are, America will not be there to, allow, to assist Israel. But somebody is there stronger than America who will be there to protect her. Okay, so it says in, uh, in the following verses, And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. That's how mighty and how great this army of alliance of nations will be. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, and that the heathen may know me, when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. So we see God allowing this to take place in his divine sovereignty, for a purpose, and he's going to do it to destroy these nations, and that is for his glory. In a few verses more, it says, And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. It's interesting. That's similar to what has taken place in the Old Testament. <clears throat> that's how they will be killing themselves. Okay, so... They will be using sword against his brother. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. So God will send some kind of a pestilence. Remember, another word for pestilence is what? Pandemics. So maybe because of this alliance of nations, can you imagine the pandemics that are taking place now? Maybe it's COVID-19. Maybe it's another one uh, with this huge army. Then eventually some of them will be contaminated with pestilence and with blood. And then God said, I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones and fire and brimstone. And why will God do this? Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself. And I will be known in the eyes of many nations. And they shall know that I am the Lord. Amazing passage. So God doing everything for his purposes and for his uh, glory. Okay, so hold on. <clears throat> okay, so in other words, what's going to happen is that according to Ezekiel 38 and other passages, let me quote you particularly verses 19 and 20, God's intervention will apparently be supernatural. We read that in some verses already. In verses 19 and 20, it says, for, for in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. An earthquake, so that the fishes of the sea, the fowls of the heaven, 
and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence and the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. Okay, that's amazing. So apparently there's going to be some supernatural intervention through nature and through, through illness and through rain and all of that so that God will intervene just before this alliance of nations attack Israel. It will be like the Old Testament days in Exodus, Joshua, Judges, and Kings. We saw that already in verses 21 down to 22. Says, I will call for a sword against him throughout all my, my mountains. Say the Lord God, every man's sword shall be against his brother. So they will be killing themselves. I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him. So we read that portion already. And then there will be damaging rain, hail, fire, and brimstone will fall on this invading forces. Okay, so that's an amazing intervention by God himself to protect his people. So while the nation of Israel has have been very stubborn and obstinate, they've taken their privileges for granted, eventually God will change their hearts sometime during the tribulation period. It will begin with those 144,000 Jews who will be converted. They will be serving as 144,000 uh, Apostle Paul, who will be preaching the gospel to the rest of the whole world. That is mentioned in Revelation chapter 7. So the spiritual restoration, the national restoration is beginning. The geographical, the, uh, rather the national restoration is already there, 1948. The geographical restoration is beginning. People, his Jews are now migrating back to Israel. The spiritual restoration will eventually take place. It has not happened yet. It will begin during the tribulation period with the 144,000 Jews who will preach the gospel to the whole world. So listen, the whole world will be evangelized not before the rapture. The whole world will be evangelized by 144,000 Jews. And add to that, the two witnesses of Moses and Elijah and the whole world will hear the gospel aside from the other witnesses during those days. That's when the whole world in Matthew 24 will hear the gospel and will be reached. Okay? So, <clears throat> um, all of this taking place during the tribulation period, God said in chapter 39, I will send fire on Magog and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles. And why would God do that? Again, who would do so, they shall know that I am the Lord. So will I make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. And I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Behold, it is come and it is done, saith the Lord God. This is the day whereof I have spoken. So prophesied some 2,500, 2,600 years ago and eventually has not yet taken place and will find its fulfillment in a time when Israel will dwell in safety and more likely that will be the time when they are in an alliance with the Antichrist, not knowing that the Antichrist, that the, you know, that the man of sin is the Antichrist himself, who will only reveal his true colors in the middle of the tribulation period. And God will do this. Why? Because as a nation, as a godless nation, Russia will eventually be judged as well, including her allies. Of course, is the Islamic nations, of course, worship another god. Uh, there are those who claim that the uh, <clears throat> that uh, Islam's god uh, is is the god of Abraham also. Okay, but that is not true apparently because they trace it back to Ishmael and then Abraham. And uh, the Muslims believe that it was not Isaac who was sacrificed in Mount Moriah. It was Ishmael who was sacrificed. And it was not in Mount Moriah. It was in Mecca instead. Okay? So that, that's how they twisted the biblical narrative. Of course, we know that it was Isaac who was sacrificed and not Ishmael. And it was in Mount Moriah, not in Mecca. You know why? 
we know that even though we're not there because we have the record of inspired scripture. It's the word of God which cannot make mistakes. So God is going to do that. And God's intention in doing all of this is to judge is Russia and her allies. It is to chasten disobedient Israel in, in consistent with God's covenant with uh, the nation under the Mosaic covenant. It is to restore Israel in keeping with his new covenant. Of course, there are already 144,000 Jews who are already preaching the gospel. But as a nation, uh, eventually, this is all part of God's dealings with them. And of course, in the verses that we have already read, it is part of God's carrying out of his divine purposes. So God is in control. He's a sovereign God. And while God uses faithful believers to accomplish his purpose, God's hand is not handcuffed so that he cannot use the unregenerate or the stubborn people who refuse him. God in his perfect so, uh, sovereignty uses believers who are obedient to him and blesses them. <clears throat> but God also in his sovereignty uses the obstinate, the stubborn, the ungodly to accomplish his purpose. Nonetheless. And they don't even realize it, that the ungodly are just human. These are just pawns in the hand of an almighty God to accomplish his divine purpose. We see that again and again all throughout biblical history and as well as uh, human history. It will happen again in, the, in, the, in biblical prophecy during the tribulation period. Okay, so that's how God is going to end this alliance of Russia and Islamic nations. Now, our often asked question is, okay, Gog and Magog uh, eventually will be leading this with these Islamic nations and eventually attack Israel. But there is a Gog and Magog mentioned in the book of Revelation. <clears throat> okay, I did mention that in your notes. At the end of the 1,000 year reign of Christ, the land of Israel, so Israel, Christ's reign has not been established. That's after the seven year tribulation period, Jesus Christ is coming back with his church to rule and reign on earth. And therefore, all kingdoms will be proven uh, spiritually and morally and politically bankrupt. He will rule and reign in perfect righteousness and justice and holiness and in love. So Jesus Christ will be the executive, the legislative, and the judicial branch all in one in all of his perfect attributes during the 1,000-year reign. So there will be perfect utopia during that time. And in spite of that, there will be rebels that will, that will surface in the scene. Now, we find in the, the end of the tribulation, or rather the end of the millennium, millennium after the 1,000-year reign, the land of Israel will once again be invaded by a massive army. Mentioned in chapter 20 of Revelation, verses 7 through 9. And the names are again Gog and Magog are used again in verse 8, Revelations 20. And, and they are used again not because they are the same people. Because God, God had already judged Russia and its allies during the tribulation period and, and destroyed them. But they are, it's Gog and Magog again because of these similar similarities, these important similarities. Number one, in both cases, the invaders are against God and against God's people. Okay, so they're all anti-Semitists. Second, in both cases, the invading army is made up of a vast multitude. Third, in both cases, Israel and Jerusalem are the targets. Fourth, in both cases, the enemy is satanically inspired. And fifth, in both cases, the enemy is going to be destroyed by God himself, supernaturally destroyed without any help from man. So this invasion in Ezekiel 38 and 39 will take place, remember, before the millennial kingdom, whereas the invasion described in Revelation 20 will take place after the thousand-year kingdom is expired. Okay. 
So the challenge is, okay, whose side would you like to be in? Okay, the God of the Bible is going to rule and reign. Sometimes we get to be a little bit impatient or very much impatient when things are going the way we want them to happen. Okay? Uh, but the truth is, God's truth is marching on. We've been going to the book of Habakkuk uh, for the past few Sundays, and Habakkuk was in chapter 1, whining and complaining against God. He was wondering why God will use the Babylonians, an ungodly people, to chastise his covenant people. So in a sense, Habakkuk was not only questioning God, he was accusing God of being indifferent, inactive, and even inconsistent. But this prophet who was supposed to be a spokesperson for God was questioning God in chapter 1. But in chapter 2, he did the wise thing. He, did, he started keeping his mouth shut and meditate on God. And God told him, you better wait and write these things. And he did the wise thing. He started waiting on God rather than complaining against God. From chapter 1, complaining or worrying. In chapter 2, he was waiting on God. And God started to reveal his will to him. Telling him, this is what's going to happen with the Babylonians. We, I'm going to deal with them. I'm not inactive. I'm not inconsistent. I am not indifferent. In fact, I will judge every sin that they have committed. And then after Habakkuk hears the explanation, it did not change what they saw. The Babylonians came. Uh, Schofield says that Habakkuk got, had, wrote that prophecy on the eve before the Babylonian captivity. Perhaps that might be the case. But if that were the case, then eventually, just the day after, the Babylonians eventually attacked them. But in spite of the fact that that is actually what happened, Habakkuk in chapter 3, after worrying and waiting, he, was beginning, he began to chapter 3, worship God. He finally realized that what God, if it's God's work, then it must be good and perfect and must be wonderful, even though I do not understand it. And what is the theme of the book of Habakkuk? Chapter 2, verse 4, he says, the just shall live by faith. And it's the same message that, God's, that God is giving to all of us today. With all that's taking place, seemingly injustice is going on unchecked, sin seems, seems to be flourishing, uh, the law is being sluggish, if not being totally ignored. There is so much chaos. And what in the world is God doing? We are tempted to question and complain. And it will do us well to listen and wait on God so that when, once we begin to see that the hand of God is behind all of this and he is accomplishing his purpose because God is still on his throne. So Habakkuk starts worshiping and praising God. So that should be the challenge to us all. All of this will be taking place. There will be a lot of uncertainty, which at least we know it has been revealed to us already. But thankfully, God remains to be on his throne, accomplishing his divine purpose. So it will always do as well to be in the right side of the line on God's side. Any questions, therefore? Any questions? Let me clear this screen. Any questions? Uh, Dr. Uh, Yoko, yeah, go ahead. I believe it's Russia. Uh, you talk about God or may God. But how do you explain that? Yes. Are you referring to Russia? I mean, is there any uh, relation? Is it to the name or the culture or the place or history or anything that you yeah, uh, find in Russia? Well, the place where uh, Gog, Magog went, this is the son of uh, Noah, okay? and he settled and migrated in the Caucasus Mountains, in that area. Okay? And then, uh, aside from that, of course, those who study the etymology of a term find out that, of course, that these are exactly the, uh, yeah, the, those who are res residing there. And once they look at the map, it's actually Russia. And it's, it's not in the, by a coincidence that it says, Rosh, okay, the Hebrew word is Rosh, and it fits very well with Russia, and then it talks about Tubalsk, uh, Tobolsk, and, uh, and other of the alliance that they have there. So while Russia is no longer a strong communist country, it still is, in a sense, 
uh, yeah, that, that's correct. Uh, Russia is is against gays. That is correct. Uh, but the Russia was anti-God. It is still communist, but it's not as strong as it were before. China is stronger now as far as uh, their ideology is concerned. But uh, uh, there are some Christians now there, of course, as if there are also Christians. I, we have some fellow missionaries in our mission board who are also uh, uh, working in the Arab nations. Okay? Uh, uh, so there are believers who are there. Now, in the, uh, yeah, there's another comment here. Only the DNA is, is, be, is translated Rosh as a proper noun. All other versions translate it as an adjective. Well, uh, well, that, well, that may be true. Let, let, we can check on the other translations. But uh, <clears throat> still, uh, it's a question of, you know, I, was, I was involved, I am involved in Bible translation. And when you come across a, an original word, like a Greek or a Hebrew word, and we're, we were the ones, we were translating Tagalog from the Greek to the Tagalog. And you come across a word, like in this case, Rosh. So you try to figure out what did the author intend to mean here? And with the limited material and resources that we have, so it could be used as an adjective, it could be used as a proper noun. And of course, the King James translated it. It, it is not a mistranslation, but it does it because it means if it's an adjective, it's, it, it talks about chief. Uh, but if it is viewed as a proper noun, then it's going to be uh, translated as Russia itself. Could you explain again how Gog and Magog and Ezekiel referring to Russia? Okay, okay. Let me uh, let me see if I can draw you to my uh, to another set of slides here, but. Uh, Okay, let me see. Okay, hold on just a second because I'm trying to get to another set of slides here that explains that even further. <clears throat> okay, here it is. Okay, let me get you to the first part. Okay, what nation will lead this nation with this coalition? It's Magog is used to describe the region where the descendants of Magog lived, according to Genesis chapter 10, verse 2. So remember, this is historical narrative. Genesis historical narrative actually happened. The children of Israel, of uh, Noah, migrated in different places. And... Uh, uh, this was the son of Japheth. Magog was one of the sons of Japheth. Are you sharing something? We cannot see anything. Oh, you, you cannot see it? Oh, hold yeah. on. Let me see. Yeah, I'm sharing something here. Uh, we don't have it. Oh, God. Yeah, let me show it again. Maybe. Uh... Okay. Okay. Okay, there it is. All right, Magog is used to describe the region where the descendants of Magog lived, according to Genesis 10, verse 2. Magog was one of the sons of Japheth, and Japheth or Japheth was one of the sons of Noah, according to Genesis 9. And Josephus, the Jewish historian, says that the descendants of Magog were by the Greeks called Scythians, and according to the Encyclopedia Britannica 1957 and the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, the Scythian people lived to the north of the Black Sea and north of the Caucasus Mountains. And this area today is part Russia, part of Russia. Gesenius, the Hebrew scholar, says that the descendants of Magog were a great and powerful people inhabiting the extreme recesses of the north so that's mago so it's basically linked to uh the children of of noah and where they migrated and it's exactly where russia is right now so russia some bible scholars such as the seniors believe that the modern name of, of russia is derived from this ancient name rosh 
because of the similarity of sounds. Also, because certain Greek writers of the 10th century AD described people living in the area later called Russia by the word rose. Uh, the Bible students take the position of Old Testament scholar Merrill Unger, who says that the word Russia was not derived from Rosh, although the general area was that now occupied by Russia and Turkey. So Merrill Unger, though he didn't say, he didn't believe that Russia came from the word Rosh, but he still believed that the general area is where Russia and Turkey is now located. See? So that's the, the, the link that will, will establish Rosh to be Russia that's called, drawn from Genesis chapter 10. Of course, Meshach is another son of Japheth, the descendants of the man. This man lived for centuries in Asia Minor, probably Cabaudosia, and then later were pushed northward by their enemies into the mountainous area southeast of the Black Sea. Today, this area borders on Russia again. Tubal was another son of Japheth, Genesis 10, verse 2 again. The descendants of this man lived in Asia Minor, not far from the Black Sea. And the descendants of Tubal and Meshech probably lived close to each other because in the scriptures, these two names are almost always found together. So this is the area of Russia. And the sons of Japheth migrated in that area, in other words. Okay. So I hope that uh, kind of established some of the connection there. Okay, this, this massive army, and aside from the fact that this massive er, uh, army, according to Ezekiel, is coming from the north. Okay. So that if, if, you, if you look at the map, that clearly establishes that right directly up north of, uh, of uh, Israel, going all the way to the north, is actually... Russia, if you'll check on the map. Okay. Uh, I hope I, I was able to answer your question. Okay, other questions? So we must uh, try to uh, monitor what Russia is doing now because uh, that's where we can roughly know what is happening in Bible prophecy. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I mean, it's been there in the scene, especially since, uh, you know, of course, the Islamic nations are already there because of terrorism, especially since 9-11. But many people did not realize that there was a connection going on with Islamic nations and Russia. But when I started hearing about, uh, you know, like those terrorists in, in Boston coming from Russia, and then... So this was kind of a link that was uh, uh, estab being established according to Bible prophecy. So these are all setting the stage for the coming tribulation period. So I think you also mentioned about Any uh, other Goma. Question? Goma is Germany. Gomer, yeah, is Germany. Togarma. Togarma is Turkey. Okay. So that's Asia Minor, okay, which is now, remember the seven letters to the churches of Revelation chapter 2 and 3? These are churches in Asia Minor, which is present-day Turkey. And uh, as we know, present-day Turkey is now dominantly Islam. See, so, so that's all how... Country, uh, all this country, uh, Goma, uh, Turkey, and uh, the, the, some European country like uh, in the Baltic area. Central. Yeah, the Baltic areas, uh, uh, some of those countries up there. Uh, <clears throat> so they are part of the, the alliance that's going to take place. Eventually, so, yeah, one of the, the ten, what ten king, ten kingdom or ten? No, the ten nation confederacy is the name is the confederacy that will be formed by the antichrist. In other words, the man of sin, the antichrist is going to be the head of that ten nation. That's going to be the revived Roman Empire. What is interesting there also is that while there are now twenty-eight nations in the European Union, I think there are twenty-eight. But they have just had an agreement that they're going to divide themselves into 10 regions. So these are not 10 nations. They're going to be 10 regions. And that's a recent development. So that's interesting because the Bible talks about a 10-nation confederacy. And that's probably going to be coming from the European Union because it's a revived Roman Empire from which the Antichrist will be coming from. 